to another episode of the Triad Diaries Radio. I'm your host, Derek Grzelski. Today on the show we have another very special guest, Stu Tripney from Athol on the Appamatara River. is a guide, a fly tire extraordinaire, a master fly caster and the punk rocker of fly fishing. He's got the tats and studs and the colorful wardrobe to match the image and if you're less than open-minded about what people look like and what they wear it would be very easy to dismiss him um, you know what what does this guy know about fly fishing and perhaps this could be the greatest mistake you've ever made in your fly fishing life because Stu Tripney is an exceptional angler and his passion is so pure and burns so bright it's very refreshing to meet him and to spend time with him. I've been passing by his little dollhouse of a tackle shop on the Appamatara for many years but I've never really met him and um, it was only last year when I was researching my Tried Bohemia book that I have spent time with him um, about three days of relearning to fly cast and then a day of fishing and it was a remarkable time and Stu is one of those people who the more time you spend with them the more you like them and so I'd like to introduce you to him and let him share some of his experiences of casting and fly tying and, and fishing the Appamatara which is exceptional river really you know it's one of, it's one of the reasons why the town of Gore further downstream has proclaimed itself the world capital of brown trout. Matara is a phenomenal river um, known for dry fly and, and, and just amazing number of fish. So without further ado, here's Stu Tripney recorded live on the Upper Matara River in Athol. <laughs> instructor and outfitter um, um, on the river and um, Stu, you've become the first uh, master caster in Australasia at the time where there was not really a tradition of casting well in New Zealand, there was something that everyone just did, uh, Fred showed you how to cast and, and kind of knew it from then on and, and you've really taken casting to a whole new standard and, and you've and you brought it into the awareness of, of people and, and suddenly you know, all the guides started to pass their exams and, and the casting has been taken to a whole new level here. Can you just tell us a little bit about your own journey into casting and, and how you've come to, to make it into such an advanced practice and skill? Yeah, well, basically I came here to New Zealand and I thought I was near the top of the ladder of my fishing skills and it wasn't long before I was in the bottom rung. I climbed back down from the top and I was on the bottom rung of the ladder and I realised this was a different ball game fishing here. It was it was a lot more challenging than anywhere else I've ever fished in the world and I, I was struggling at the start to catch the fish and see them and then I, I actually it was at that point I realised my casting wasn't up to it, my presentations. I had to be even more accurate, and I thought I was accurate before in the past, but I was probably, you know, I wasn't sight fishing and seeing my target. And so I had to improve on that. And as I gradually started to do that, I then had to learn to cast into the wind because every other day it was windy, and I thought, can't go fishing today, it's too windy. So I had to figure out how to cast into the wind and improve my accuracy, basically my skill level in, in, in fishing and casting. So uh, before you came to New Zealand, I mean, you, you've come here because of the trout, and I know from fishing and talking with you before, you, you had quite a big life before, and you've driven safari trucks in Africa, you've guided people to see the mountain gorillas, and, and you were in Okavango and Zambezi River, 
And where where did you fish before, and for what what species of fish before you came to New Zealand? Before I came to New Zealand, I was basically fishing as a kid, through my youth for all different species of fish, but mainly brown trout, where I grew up in Scotland and small streams. And I progressed from bait fishing into fly fishing, any method at all to catch the fish. And what was it that attracted you to New Zealand? All New Zealand, you know, it's, it's, it's the Mecca, you know, everyone knows about New Zealand and its trout. And so it was always on the cards to come here, eventually to come to New Zealand and fish and do the famous walks as well, which I, I came here and I did the walks and I did the fishing and I struggled with the fishing. And, but I loved it, you know, I loved the challenge of it all. And That seems to be a pattern with a lot of anglers that I've fished and talked to. Um, some are very experienced people who have fished pretty much everywhere else in the world. And, and they come to New Zealand and, as, as yourself, they think themselves at the top of their game. And it's, it's, a, it's a whole new start here, isn't it? Yeah, it is. This is just, you know, the, the, one of the most commonly used na uh, words in, in my shop from really passionate anglers that have come here is, I've been humbled. Stu, I've been humbled. I thought I could fish. I've fished all my life, but I've been humbled. And that's some big names I meet come through the shop. Some pretty famous fly fishers, you know, that I've looked up to through the years, from, especially from overseas. You know, and they're just humbled. It's the magic word, humbled. And why, why is that? They're, they're humbled because their expectations are probably through the roof sometimes and the skill level is not up there. Um, it's not good enough to catch the fish. They'll struggle. And it's not until they're here and they see the way these fish behave and they see the need for accurate casting and good presentation through that as well that um, they struggle it's a very much a, a vertical learning curve isn't it from from the day you start here and 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 unfortunately in for because people like you are here we we can sort of learn the skills uh, easily now i mean that there are you don't have to sort of blaze your own path anymore you know you can come and and learn the 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 casting technique as it's required in New Zealand and it's really about the presentation and accuracy I mean the two magic words here it's not so much what fly uh, the fish are feeding on it's more how you present it isn't it yeah I think it's a little bit of all three to be honest um, you've got to be able to cast accurately present it and then as long you know as far as I'm concerned the fish don't know the Latin names these are smart fish but they don't know the Latin names I've got one client that says they do read books at night, but I don't know about that. They, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I, I you got to be accurate here. The th three things you need is accuracy, presentation, and then the right choice of fly. I think that is important. Well, size, shape and size more than anything, because, you know, like I said, you know, the fish don't know the Latin names. If you can tell us a little bit about your own journey into fly casting, I mean, you thought you can cast, and then you realised that you were really short on skills here, and what, what happened then? Well, I say, uh, I came here, thought I could cast and fish, and basically I was pretty crap. <laughs> I analysed myself and thought, geez, I'm not good enough if I want to have success here. So I started this journey to get better and I bought every DVD, bought every book, I was on the internet non-stop and I was searching all over New Zealand for help and I went to a few different people and you always learn something from them but I started to think to myself, do they really know about casting? And from that, um, after years of doing that and setting a goal I found out there's a qualification in the US, FFF uh, Masters, single-handed casting, and I decided before I die, that's what I want to um, achieve. And, you know, I'm lucky I did the hard work and I managed to do it. But I studied, 
and I cast for eight years. I spent two years casting with my left hand at all fish. I did cheat a couple of times when it was a big fish and went back to my right hand, I do admit. But, um, you know, I just pushed myself and pushed myself. Why did you change hands? What What's the reason behind that? Well, I wanted to learn to cast my left hand because I was, I was starting to teach people. And sometimes if I was standing behind them and sh demonstrating, I realized if they were left-handed, it was easier if they watched me operate with my left hand. And, you know, and it's good to be able to cast with both hands. And I realized that, but I couldn't tie my shoelaces with my left hand. I was it was absolutely a waste of time being there. But I just forced myself. And it took two years. And I can cast quite good with my left hand now, both hands. You know, and it might, you know, Maybe I thought it impressed the chicks, I don't know. And did you? <laughs> well, no, because Ela, my lovely woman, um, she's never seen me cast my left hand. <laughs> Listening to the Tra Daris Radio, I'm your host Derek Grzelski, bringing you the best of fly fishing in New Zealand. I know that you've sought out some of the best teachers um, in the world of fly casting and um, you went and studied with them and, and spent time and, and, and sort of picked their brains and then applied all that knowledge. Realistically, what, how much time, how much effort does it take to learn to cast well? It took me a long time because I was full of faults and bad habits and I wasn't very efficient. But nowadays with my knowledge when I get people with basically no skills, it's always good if they've got no skills at all when I get them, no bad habits to break. And if I get somebody really keen, I can usually have them casting within a few days better than what I could in 13 years. So, you know, with the right um, help, you can become good quite quickly, I feel. And maybe I don't play golf, but maybe the same for golf, you know. But you're always going to get better and better as you progress, you know. You never stop learning. I never stop learning. I may have this certification, but it's not going to stop me hiring someone that I think I can learn some more off of. But I think the key here is to actually be that blank slate when you start with because I know um, I had to unlearn a lot of things and and it's there's a danger in sort of learning from your friends and mates and buddies that everyone you know is full of good advice and they see you cast or ski or play golf and everyone volunteers uh, to help you and that's not always a good advice yes yeah you're, you're correct because uh, to be honest, my bu my business wouldn't survive. I specialise in faults and fixtures, helping people. And if everybody was taught correctly right at the start, I wouldn't have that uh, opportunity to actually pay the bills. <laughs> uh, and that that is true. A lot of people get taught off to friends and they, they pick up bad habits. Not, they become not efficient fire casters. But I do see a lot of, you know, um, New Zealanders who are born here. I'm obviously not. I'm originally from Scotland. Who have fished here all their life. And 
quite a few of them do need help with the casting, but a lot of them are actually quite efficient, the ones that do it uh, quite often, get to go out there, and they probably don't realise how efficient they are because they can catch these fish. They find it quite easy, some of them. And then they ask me and goes, I don't understand what all these foreigners are saying that they can't catch these fish. It's quite easy. And the skill level is right up there, especially down here in the South Island on the brown trout, which seems to be a lot more wary and more challenging to catch than the rainbow trout. I guess if you learn to fish on those challenging trout, then you know everything else is easy, right? Yeah, I say to people when I teach them, I say, if you can catch New Zealand trout, especially in the slower waters down here, down in Southland, you, the rest of the world will become easy. Because here you have to, for the chances of success, you have to be on the money. You have to, everything's got to be right. It's got to come together and you'll catch the fish. It's so rewarding. It can, you know, it's, it's very challenging, but the rewards are, are there. You could fish all day and you get one shot and you need it all together to make that one shot happen. You know, I've just, on the way to you, I've come back from spending a week of fishing um, around the bottom half of the South Island and within that week we had, you know, some big cicadas, we had mayflies, we had willow grub, all dry fly, no nymphs, not even once. And, and yet most of this fish um, were pretty much sort of one, two cast opportunities because you know, there's been quite a lot of anglers um, on rivers. This is the peak season. And, um, yeah, they're, they're just very unforgiving, those fish. Yeah, and, you know, that's making me smile listening to you say that because I've been out guiding and this is probably the easiest time of the, the year to catch these fish is when they're up on the surface. They're taking... You know, they're eating double cheeseburgers or palm frits when it's willow grubs. And, they, you know, it's yeah, that's great fun. It's exciting. It, it's exciting, but then still, the, you know, from my experience last few days, you, you have to be there with a sort of one, two cast. I mean, the fish are feeding on, on willow grub or on, on mayflies. Even during evening hatches, they're, um, the fish were, you know, your chances of success drop down with sort of every cast, and I think one time we were down to below zero <laughs> with just you know, three, four casts. It was it was all over. Just the element of surprise is so important in in, in, in getting catching this trout here. Yes, the 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 first cast. I know from guiding. I spot that fish. I see that fish. I'm saying to my client, "Do you see the fish? Make sure they can see the fish." And then I say, "Okay." I want you to land the fly, say, one meter to the right of it, one foot to the right of it, three inches to the left of it, etc. I know that's where the fly needs to be to catch the fish. And I also know the first cast is pretty crucial. And every cast after that, normally the chances go down. It goes, you know, something like maybe 70% chance the first time if you get it right. I think the study's been done, 50%. Next cast, 30% by the third cast. That's where they did the studies. I think it was somewhere in Nelson area. But there is some places I fish down here, especially big old browns. I'll say, I'll say if I get it all right, I've got 50% chance and then zero. It's all or nothing, isn't it? Yeah, all or nothing. And that's when you, you're you pumping, you know. You're tying that fly on, you're all excited. And, and your brain, my brain's going... I've got to get it right, first cast. But I can't tell my clients that because there's too much pressure. But my returning clients know that and they just look at me going, oh, no, I've got one shot. It's something I never thought about, but the, the pressure on, you know, we think of the pressure on the guy to deliver the goods, to deliver the opportunities. But the clients feel just as much performance anxiety as the guide feels the pressure to deliver, right? I mean, that you're coming to this, you've traveled you know, halfway around the world and you get this fish right in front of you and you've got one cast. You know, it's, it is all or nothing, right? It's definitely all or nothing, but that's why I can't tell my client that. 
They just go to pieces on me. They thought every fish will never catch a fish. I just go, oh, there's a nice big fish. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, that's the biggest fish I've seen in this river. Oh, I hope he gets it. He's got one shot, blah, 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 no drag, etc. I can't say that to them. So they'll have a cast and fluff it up. But maybe in two days, if I've got them, my clients for a few days, two days later, I'll turn around and say, remember that fish? Well, that was the biggest fish I've ever seen in that river. And the first cast was so important. And then after a few days, my clients normally know it's the first cast. I don't like to say it to them. Unless I get to know my clients, then we have a bit of a laugh and I just shout, remember, no pressure. Yeah, I remember from fishing with you that, that you're one of the very few guides that I've met, very few actually people, anglers, that that just take such great delight just to be on the river and fishing and, and not, um, you know, be so performance-driven, even though you like to catch fish and you like to create opportunities. But, but the, the, the fun is, I mean, the, the picture is much bigger than just delivering the pounds and inches and, and, and numbers. And I, I really enjoy that, that aspect of fishing with you. Now, there is another aspect to casting to a fish, which not many anglers probably realize until they um, come to face that fish, is that whatever casting, however good you are at casting, when you think, however good you think you are at casting, when you're casting to that fish, your your abilities often drop significantly just due to excitement and just the pressure and, and and you know you're not at your hundred percent necessarily, right? Uh, yeah, you see that fish, you go to pieces. You may be a good caster, and I've seen some of the best casters, you know, fishing to fish, and they just go to pieces. So th- there is there is that aspect, but if you're a poor caster and not very efficient, and you see that fish of a lifetime, and you go to pieces, it's just one big puddle big puddle of line that goes out you know and that fish just looks at you winks and swims off what i've seen you know very often is that you say if you goof up that first cast and and the fish spooks or and then you cast in the second cast it's perfect or you know and 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 your friend your buddy say well this this should have been the first cast and it's always so easy and often you know I, i i know i've made it a habit of if i if i don't make the first cast you know, at the money cast, the, the really good one, then I'll just sort of practice, like, if the fish was still there, even if it's not, because that's that's all adds up to that critical mass of experience, right? That's funny you say that, because I actually do do that with, especially new clients. Nine times out of ten, they spook the first fish I put them onto, and it swims off, and then I'll just say, just relax, just imagine it's there, and keep casting. And it's usually about the 15th or 20 cast, to be honest, where I say, that's the cast we need. But we need to get it in the first cast, preferably. And we usually, eventually with a bit of tuition, we usually pull something off. But if I've got somebody that can cast accurately and I'm guiding them, I can cover a lot of water and we've got more chances of catching fish. Okay, and... Um... If for people who are thinking of coming to New Zealand, and you know this is all, this is often the the dream come true. That's sort of often a trip of a lifetime. Or um, what sort of advice would you have in regards to casting and and preparing for coming to fish in New Zealand? Well, for years I used to write when I got inquiries for guiding, etc. I used to send out some information, practices, practice that, and to be honest. No one ever done it. They just arrive and presume it's all going to be easy. So I gave up actually giving that advice. So I'm not going to give it. I'm only joking. No, I, my, my advice would be, like I've always said, to practice casting. Practice casting, especially short distances. Get your accuracy right, good. Uh, be able to cast into the wind and... Practice casting with a leader about 12 to 14 feet long because a lot of places in the world, and I've fished in quite a lot of places in the world, and it's great to do so because I learned a lot, but most places you've got a lot 
shorter length of leader you're using. So it's good to get used to a longer length of leader so you don't overcast when you see fish because people aren't used to that length. So they'll usually sometimes line the fish. That's that's my advice. And, and get a good get a good look for a FFF certified casting instructor or better still a master and go and get a lesson, a one on one lesson. You you'll you'll never regret it. Um, it's a, the FFF is a fantastic organisation, and you know they just don't give away those those um, certificates. You've got to earn them. You know, example, the Masters has got a, a huge failure rate, but you don't really fail. But it's you know there's a lot of people don't don't pass. Uh, hopefully they do in the future when they resit it. But you know it's like a hundred bucks to sit it. There's every chance that you may not pass, and that's that was the attraction for me. It's not given to you on a silver plate like some some things in the world. Radio. I'm your host Derek Rizowski, bringing you the best of fly fishing in New Zealand. aspects of that are covered in casting. Now the third one is the choice of flies and and here you have a lot to contribute as well because you you're well known um, for your innovative fly designs especially um, the one that you use um, foam and tying and um, what are your if you were to um, give us your three favorite patterns in your design what would they be? I'd have to say, you know, I've got so many designs, but I'll knuckle it down to three. I'd have to say, what example, my biggest achievement in fly design is one of the most simple flies I've ever... It's two components, and it's a floating willow grub. That took over nine years to finish, and I've sat with lots of other fly tires trying to design one... Uh, fly that could fool the fish when they're eating willow grubs and after nine years I managed to do it and yet when you look at it it's so simple but that took thousands of hours and a lot of hard work and when I first came here people would say that the fish are eating willow grubs you can't catch them or you, or you can't catch them on a willow grub you can maybe catch them with another fly but you know that's like a, a rag to a bull for me so I was determined to crack it and you know, I've come up with this fly and it's pretty much has caught more fish for a lot of people, um, especially fish feeding on willow grubs. And I've pro proven that you that you can catch fish when they're feeding on willow grubs if you use use this pattern and light tip it. You've got a high chance of catching them. So that's just, you know, you'd have to look at my website or whatever or a photo to see it. Are you, are you talking about the famous banana fly, right? Well, you call it the banana fly, but there's no actual bananas here. But, it, yeah, it's got a little kink in it. I suppose you could look at it like a banana. Maybe the trout think it is a banana because they like it. Yeah, well, I can I can attest to that because we've just the last two days of our trip, we had willow grub action, and, and it's quite phenomenal fishing, really, because... The fish there are usually quite difficult. They, you know, once they get onto willow grub, they up in the surface and and they're moving about and and they're much more approachable. And if you got the right fly, I mean, I I 
fish with the banana fly, your <laughs> banana fly, and um, I did this time around. I didn't get any refusals. I mean, they're pretty much all the fish I got. They were you know first first cast and they saw it, they wanted it, and yet um, I know from friends and 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 you know the the, the history of developing working willow grab fly has been a, a total failure because everyone had their pattern and they, they had this idea and they would go and tie it up and they tried it didn't work and someone else said well you have to do this and they'll try that and that didn't work and and really until the banana appeared that there wasn't really a fly that worked consistently. Now that's correct you know and I think no fly works all the time but you got a really high chance on willow grub grubbing fish to to catch to catch them using this design and it's just you know it's based on you know the imprint of the grub when it falls in the surface film as i filmed and studied these fish feeding on them over the years and i realized it's the imprint that seems to trigger them not only the imprint but when the willow grub wriggles but I, I tried to make a wriggling one, but you just, I just couldn't. So I settled for just the imprint. And again, it, you've got more ch chance of success, especially when the willow grub. And if you can land that fly inches from the nose and gives them less time to inspect. At some t so the accuracy, again, back to the casting. You know, you've got to be accurate for success. I was guiding the other day and my two lovely gentlemen who said told me they were very experienced had no accuracy whatsoever every fish we saw the cast were like two meters to the left the right behind and we didn't hook up all day and yet these fish were feeding and then today i had two lovely guys again who were quite accurate casters you know and we filled 13 fish willow grubbing so they you know the accuracy and the skill level you know, you, you need it here in New Zealand. That's for willow grub and fish. And most of the fishing in general down here in the South Island. I mean, the willow grub is, is a very tiny fly. I mean, you tie it now in size 20s and 18s, and I used 16, and, and that worked really well. But on the other end of that scale, your fly developments are really big flies, like the cicada. And uh, we fished uh, early in the week. We fished another river that um, it's well known for its cicada hatch, if you can call it that. And uh, the fly just worked phenomenally well. I think it's, um, I mean, it has a post, it's very visible in the water, even in broken water. It has legs, it moves really well. And uh, it just fish just find it irresistible, really. Can you tell us about the your cicada? Yeah, well, just now, because it's nice and hot, you know, that I think I know the river, I won't say its name, that you were fishing there the other day, but it doesn't have willow trees along the side of it, so it doesn't, where you were fishing it, it doesn't have fish eating willow grubs. So, yes, the fish there focus more on the cicadas in that area, and the cicadas hatch every year here in New Zealand. And for years I've been trying to perfect this, as I do, you know, a bit of a perfectionist, the, a cicada fly, and I've had lots of different ones through the years, but I was never happy with them. And I've looked back now, so it's 14 years ago with some still photographs that, that I'd taken of some prototype cicadas, fly, uh, designs I'd done. I actually, a couple of years ago, went back to the first prototypes, my design, and then took that design, reworked it, pimped it up, as they say in America. And, you know, the the deadly cicada flies, I call it, uh, was born. And a lot of it is the profile, the shape, the silhouette. It's got a really nice silhouette to it. Uh, and it's easy to see because of the post. I realize visible flies are pretty, pretty much a, a must if you want to catch more fish. And a lot went into the thoughts of the hook, you know, getting the, the right hook so it's got a big wide gape. Because one of the best selling cicada flies for years until this one was successful, but you'd lose a lot of fish because the hook gape was pretty much covered up with the deer hair body. 
I had that experience um, actually with the same fly where where you would see um, the fish, you know, the cicada coming down and the fish taking the fly and you strike and you've seen the fish take it and then there's nothing. And um, the way you've explained to me was that the, the, the gape of the hook was basically covered by the deer hair. So there was a, a high percentage of failed hookups because the gape just wasn't big enough. Yeah, that, that's correct. And because I was using them for years before I'd finished this design, I was using that, that design quite often in the summer. I realized this, so I'd actually, I'd bend the hook out sometimes, which is not right, but well, that's what I had to do um, to get more chance of hookups. Whereas this, this um, pretty much new design I brought out, the hook gape, I'm using Timco really strong hooks and the hook gape's wide open. It's got that perfect silhouette. It's got the rubber legs that twitch in the water. Give that that um, that look of an escape and trap cicada. And then you've got that easy to see post in the top. I've got a foam head that just hangs over the eye of the hook, which helps the fly set more ho horizontal in the surface. So it aids flotation, the foam head, so there's a reason. As well as I like using foam, there is a reason for it. If I'm using an indicator and a heavy weighted nymph with like a dropper tied off of it, that dropper will normally be the pogo nymph. Um, and the pogo nymph I designed, I designed so that it floats. So you pull it down with the heavy nymph. The heavy nymph bounces along the bottom and acts like an attractor. The fish see the heavy nymph, swim across, and then they see the little pogo nymph bouncing around because it wants to float and rise up to the surface so it's like a pogo stick it's bouncing around and it's looking like it's a nymph swimming underwater and it, so what you're doing if you use it um, if you rig it like that you're actually creating movement to a small nymph which is quite unique so you're pulling it down with a heavy one and a short piece of tip it off the back of it and attach this floating nymph and that, that floats around, that's pogos all over the place, and the fish normally can't resist it. We, um, with nymphs, I mean, we always try to go, 
you know, heavy because the nymph has to get down there. And yet the, the real life nymphs, the naturals, I mean, they don't go around clanking along the rocks of the river like, you know, our tungsten nymph do and, and the really heavy nymphs. And yet we have to get down there to the bottom of the river. So the pogo nymph, which, if I don't betray a, a little secret of yours, has a foam in its body, right, in the, in the thorax. That makes it float up. And so the the heavy nymph holds it down and, and the pogo just really behaves like, like a natural floating down and, and just above the above the bottom. Yeah, that's correct. And I think when I, if I think about it, a, a lot of my fly designs have got triggers built into them so that, you know, I've, the willow grub, the silhouette, the cicada, the rubber twitching legs, the shape of the cicada's body and the pogo nymph Again, silhouette, but movement. You create movement if you use it in that, that way. And it's and you can also float it just in the surface film, and it works really good sometimes on fish just sipping, floating them. So just little um, spent spinner, you know, fish are feeding on um, dead mayfly, spent spinners. Sometimes I'll just float that in the surface film, especially in spring creeks. I find it um, really successful. And it, yeah, and it's featured in a few books now. I've actually even seen it in a magazine in America. Someone writing about it, which is is, is pretty much an honour. And it's a recognition of a really good design because, I mean, it's easy enough to make something look like a, a, a natural insect, but to make it move like it, that's a whole different game, isn't it? Yeah, because well, years ago when I was guiding, as I was designing it. To before I designed it, what I was doing is I was using a heavy nymph with the standard pheasant tail off the back of it, and I started to figure out why the fish would take the small pheasant tail because it looked more like the shape and size of the natural nymphs in the water systems. So nearly 95 percent of the time, the fish would take the small pheasant tail, and then I started looking at it and watching real live nymphs on the Batara River actually years ago, and. And I could see them whizzing around above the, the the stones and in the current and stuff. And I thought, what if I made, basically, if I made a nymph that could float and then I create movement like the naturals, you know, a trigger. And that's how it came around, the, the, the pogo nymph. And and really, you know, I used to draw, and the, the name pogo, I'll be honest, I say it's a pogo stick because a lot of people can relate to that. But years ago, I used to drive like rock and friends and rock and roll bands and stuff. And people used to do this punk rock dance at the front of the stage where they bounce up and down. So really, when I designed, I just called it the pogo. It was actually, it was actually to do with the punk rock dance. But I realised I could never sell a fly called the punk nymph. <laughs> well, Stu is a, a, a punk rocker from Glasgow. Of, uh long history of that but now you're on the Mata upper matara river in athol you have um, a, a wonderful little shop here um, full of um, unique flies and and things that really work on the upper matara what is different about the river here um, as opposed to other rivers in new zealand because I mean, matara is one of the best known brown trout rivers in the world probably um known for its dry fly, quite clockwork, hat, like hatches. What's different about uh, Upper Matara uh, from your experience here? The Matara in general is a fantastic river, you know, and there's lots of other fantastic rivers in the world and here in New Zealand. But it's, it's known because it's quite diverse and it holds a good population of quite large-sized trout. Not huge, but large, you know. And a lot of them too. And a lot of them. And the lower reaches over 200 fish per kilometre and then the upper reaches about 50 to 60 fish per kilometre. And the upper reaches, it's smaller, it's clear and it's sight fishing. The lower is not not as much sight fishing but fishing to rising fish. And you know, on, on average the fish will be anywhere from two four pound you catch your six pound fish in the matara that's that's a trophy i would say um and it's a fantastic fishery but up here up the top where it's clear it's slow moving water 
the fish can be really they're known for being really tricky to to catch you know this is a humbling fishery but it's also very good i mean some of my best days of fishing i've had on the on the upper matara and and some of the hatchers been quite phenomenal here oh yeah you know you you you're guaranteed you're going to see fish at least because some rivers you could walk all day in New Zealand and not see a fish. It pretty much guarantees you're going to have shots at fish. And some days it can be quite easy, and, and but most often it's not. It's quite a it's it's not a beginner's playground, but it's a great place for me. I love um, guiding people on it because it's a great teaching ground because if you can catch them in the upper matara i think the rest of new zealand becomes a little bit easier because i remember you telling me about um, some clients you had who had um, a house on the tongariro river and they pretty much lived on fish and you know fish all their lives and they were kind of legends of their own making and then they came here and tried to fish the upper matara and they came to you crying didn't they yeah yeah well they're not the first people crying that come in that shop i've usually got a box of hankies ready for most fishermen but yeah these gentlemen came in and they, they and i didn't know how, how experienced they were and they were crying you know they couldn't catch the fish so then i says you know how long have you fished here and they said we've been here three days so then i was like oh and i says well how experienced are you and then they just looked at me and says We've got plenty of experience. We own houses in Turangi, and we catch trout all the time. And we've got smokers in the back garden. We've been here for three days, and we can't catch these beep fish. So in the end, they hired me, and we had some success. But their approach was all, you know, the, the tippets were too heavy, the flies were too big, they were casting indicators like budgies and it was just scaring the life out of these fish and a couple of those people now have returned a couple a couple of times and used me again and it's and it's interesting for me because these are guys that catch fish in the north island quite often and, and some other places in the south island but they they seem to return here because of the challenge the challenge of the fishery and they turn around to me there this year and says this is real fishing. This is real fishing. And that just made me smile because they got it. It's challenging. It ain't easy. But, you know, when it happens, it's so rewarding. It's fishing. Yeah, this is this is Apple Matara. Stu Tripney is a guide, fly casting instructor, and an amazing fly tire um, in Athol on the Apple Matara. You'll find him, you'll find him at stewsflyshop.com. And um, thanks very much for your time, Stu. And um, we'll look forward to more of the challenging fishing on the Upper Matara with you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been nice talking to you. we'll be talking to another guide, Ian Cole. Ian is one of the most experienced guides in New Zealand. He's based in Wanaka in the Southern Lakes District and he fishes predominantly the bottom half of the South Island. We'll be talking about the nature of sight fishing and the distinctions that make New Zealand fishing different from elsewhere in the world and also the riverine etiquette that comes with it. We've had a very busy season and as I know there has been a few run-ins and almost confrontations on the riverbank where anglers um, try to cut in in front of each other and we'll talk about the requirements for side fishing and the need for giving each other enough space to really hunt trout properly you know, elsewhere in the world when you see a car parked by the side of the river 
it, it might entice you to stop because you, you think it's, it's a good place to fish. In New Zealand, it's a little bit different, and we will explore just how different it is and, and what are the requirements and the needs for respecting each other's space and the way to avoid river side confrontations and so everyone can have a good day. You've been listening to the Trout Diaries radios with Derek Grzelski bringing you the best of fly fishing in New Zealand. Until the next time, tight lines and happy fishing. <laughs>